Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Mars and our May Best Practices on Partnerships. I'm very pleased to welcome today Jeff Dennis and Tracy Huey from Faskin Martineau Dumoulin LLP, who will be talking to us about the issues that you need to consider before committing to a partnership. Jeff is a lawyer and a serial entrepreneur. He recently joined Faskin Martineau Dumoulin as their entrepreneur in residence. He spent the past eight years as a trusted advisor to CEOs of high growth companies and has been involved with the startup as well as the acquisition and financing for a wide variety of ventures. Jeff earned his undergraduate degree in economics at Brown University and his law degree at the University of Western Ontario. He's a graduate of the Birthing of Giants Executive Education Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Director's Education Program of the Institute of Corporate Directors and the Rotman School of Business. Tracy is a partner in the Securities and Mergers and Acquisitions Practice Group and Life Sciences Industry Group at Fask and Martineau, a leading international law firm. Her practice focuses on mergers and acquisitions and capital raising activities in both the public and private markets and on matters concerning corporate governance and security law compliance. Tracy regularly advises clients on the structuring and negotiation of long-term business relationships, including partnership agreements and shareholder arrangements. As a result, she's experienced with the identification and a resolution of related issues and understands the sensitive nature of negotiations at the early stages of the new relationships. So please help me in welcoming Tracy and Jeff and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marielle, and thank you for taking time today to come and spend lunchtime with us. I don't see any food in the room, so I guess we're pretty safe. Um, before I start, I just want to kind of fill in a little bit about my background. Um, you know, as you heard, I'm a lawyer, uh, but I've spent the last 20 some odd years as an entrepreneur. Started a business in 1989 and had been involved in financing and operating a variety of businesses uh, through many different industries. When I sold out to my partners in 2003, I, you know, kind of thought that what I really loved about business was the startup and the early stage, and um, I guess. What I find most interesting is working with the CEOs and trying to share uh, my experiences and the experiences of some others that I've watched and learned from and try to help them get to their, the next level. Um, you know, for the last eight years, I've been working pretty much on my own, working with a variety of different companies. Uh, and I've always kind of kept my eye open for a platform from which I could work um, to develop what I love to do, but also have the synergy of an organization that has a lot of smart people that I can collaborate with and be creative with. And uh, last week I landed at Faskin Martineau, and Faskin is one of the largest law firms in the country. Um, it has a very broad uh, practice base and has offices really uh, across coast to coast, but also uh, in Europe and, and in Africa. Um, but one area where they want to become a leader uh, is in this whole area of uh, technology and early stage companies. And so I've joined them to help them build a practice uh, attracting early stage companies. And they've been incredibly supportive of me. And uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for me. And this uh, event is just one example of the kind of resources. So today what we're going to talk about um, is sort of the soft side, which I'm going to deal with, that is, you know, what's it like to have a partner and, you know, do you really want a partner and is this the right partner and who's going to do what and who's going to be responsible for what and what kind of powers you're going to have and uh, the whole issue of communication and what it takes to sort of make sure that there's uh, care and feeding of the partnership. Um, and then I'm going to switch over and Tracy's going to come and deal with some of the harder issues uh, the legal issues uh, from talking about putting it in writing, uh, what's the nature of the relationship, uh, contributions that everybody puts in and things that you can take out and your powers and rights and rights to information and how decisions are made and, and so on and so on and then finally how do you get out of it if it's not working out or you have to get out for some reason like death or incapacity. So I'm going to deal with the uh, the first issue is, you know, do you really want a partner? And I guess 
uh, and for today's purposes, let's talk about a partnership. Um, we're not talking necessarily about a traditional partnership, like a legal partnership, although it applies. But we're talking about any kind of situation where um, two or more people join together in a business combination, and they could be in a partnership, or it could be a limited partnership, or it could be a corporation, or a joint venture, or something. Uh, that's what Tracy's going to talk about, and it depends on lots of factors. But I'm going to just talk about what it's like working with other human beings and trying to get along and playing nice in the sandbox. And, um, you know, in my case, I started, as I said, in 1989. One of my law school classmates and I, we uh, started a business together, um, and we were like brothers. I mean, literally. We were together for almost 20 years. Uh, through tough times, we built a business. Through tough personal times, we kind of looked out for each other. Um, and we did all the right things in the sense that, you know, some of the things that we're going to talk about later in terms of the care and feeding of that partnership, we did the right things. And we, it was in writing, and we had agreements, and we had um, regular uh, planning sessions and retreats, and, and we did all the right things. But then, about eight years ago, we had a major disagreement. And we had a major uh, difference in view in terms of the direction of the business. And after a lot of soul searching, um, I decided that I wanted to do something else. And so because we had an agreement in place and we had a, a shotgun provision, which Tracy will also talk about in more detail, I, after a lot of soul searching, exercised my legal rights. And we went through this whole sort of difficult period of trying to figure out what they're going to buy me out for and what it's worth and so forth. Um, I thought it would be friendly. I thought we were blood brothers. I thought, you know, 20 years together, I might sound like, you know, a divorcee right now, you know, and this is a, um, you know, self-help group. But, you know, I really kind of was surprised. But the next morning after I issued the, um, the notice of the shotgun, um, the doors were locked and I couldn't get in the office. And that was it. I never, ever stepped foot back in that office again. And the reason I put this up, because about two weeks later, a truck pulls up to my driveway at home, and they leave all my boxes, 20 years of legal precedence that I'd taken with me from when I was a practicing lawyer that I hadn't looked at in 20 years, to you know, all the chuchkas on my desk and pens that my mother had given me for graduation. And all that stuff were in boxes on my driveway. And that's kind of, it went out with a bang and not a whimper. So it was a pretty tough time. And, and what was the lesson? Well, the lesson, I guess, was that shit happens. I mean, life <laughs> changes, people's attitudes change, people's, you know, uh, timeline in terms of where they are in their life and what they want from a business and where they want to live and how they want to live and all those soft things, you know, you can't necessarily provide for today when you're starting a partnership. And you kind of have to keep that stuff in mind as you move forward. Um, I like to say that partnership is like a marriage. Uh, easy to get into, very messy to get out of. And I guess when we talk about the legal stuff, it's, you know, you basically need a prenuptial agreement, a prenup. Um, often, you know, people get into bed with partners um, almost faster than they would hire an, an important employee. You know, you're all excited about this new venture, you're working, you know, in a basement or in an incubator or whatever, and you're cheek to jowl, and, you know, it's, it, it consumes all your time and all your passion, and you don't really think about the personal relationship because you're just in love with the business. And it may not be that you're in love with the person. And it kind of clouds your judgment, I find, because you're so focused on the business, you don't really think about, you know, who you're getting into bed with, who you're getting into this marriage with. And, you know, often people don't even bother putting it in writing. They, you know, barrel along, and then later when there's issues or things start to be uneven for some reason, then, you know, you put forward a shareholders agreement or a partnership agreement, and then all hell can break loose. So... You know, I guess all I'm saying is don't go into it lightly. Think about, you know, whether you really want a partner and need a partner. Um, make sure that this is the right person. 
And look at alternatives to partnership. You don't have to give up equity necessarily to get contributions from people who have things that you need. Or you don't have to necessarily give up too much equity. Um, but you can work on all sorts of other uh, performance related uh, contracts and arrangements. So I guess my point, as I said, is just don't barrel in so fast. Make sure that you're getting in bed with the right, with the right partner. Um, sorry. You know, as I said, we often uh, spend time uh, interviewing employees longer and spend more time with our employees than we do with our partners. And um, so as you go through this, we'll call it the dating process, um, some of the questions you should be asking yourself are, you know, do they share your values? Uh, when I say values, I'm talking about, you know, integrity and, uh, you know, is their sh handshake their bond? Are they people of their word? You know, uh, do you, and sometimes it's cultural, you know, make sure that you really share the same values. Then talk about the goals and expectations of the business. Um, you know, some people are looking for a hobby. I mean, the perfect example was uh, Steve Jobs and his partner, Wozniak. Um, if you read the book by Isaacson, it became very clear that, you know, Wozniak loved, he was kind of the inventor, garage guy, and he loved to play, and he wanted to have a, an open system, much like Microsoft, because he wanted all the, the geeks to be able to play with it and, and improve it and, and communicate about it, and he really was a hobbyist at heart. Whereas Jobs, for all the negatives you hear about him, he was a true visionary who, you know, had this idea about a closed system that would provide a really elegant solution. And they parted company essentially over that issue. But it was really about their vision, their goals, and their expectations from the business. Um, the whole issue of timeline. I, I had a partner at one point, and we were about 15, age, 15 years in, in difference in terms of age. Well, you know, he's going to retire to Florida 15 years earlier than I might. And so how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with um, the fact that, you know, you may have different obligations? So at a certain times in your life, you might be putting kids through school or paying for elderly parents or whatever. And so all those issues of timeline, whether it's retirement or your needs for your own personal self, are really important things to understand as you go into the business. Um, you know, what are you each contributing? Um, typically you go into a partnership because people need something, right? You need money, uh, you need some property, so, you know, it's an IT, you've created a logarithm or you've got some product, um, or just sweat equity, you've got some expertise and you're prepared to roll up your sleeves and make it happen. So, you know, how do you value those things and, and how do you figure out you know, who gets what and who gets compensated for what, because it's not just about ownership, um, but it can also be about compensation. Um, and then lastly, in, in my experience, your best test is your gut. And as we discussed earlier, um, you know, a lot of people get into these things because they love the business and they're, you know, really excited about the business opportunity and they put these personal issues aside. You know, sit down and think about it and really trust your gut. If you've got a bad feeling about somebody, you're probably right. And just, you know, cool it down and, and rethink your decision. So as you move forward and you've now decided that, you know, you want to work with this person, then there's a whole set of issues about, you know, who does what and how do you make decisions and who has power and, and so on. And again, before you go barreling in, make sure that you talk about these issues. Um, the first point I talk about is the distinction uh, between ownership and employment. You know, when you start off in a business, everybody's got their sleeves rolled up and everybody does every job and there's really no distinction. You know, somebody might have a title as chairman or CEO or CFO or COO or, you know, chief cheerleader or some cute title like that. But at the end of the day, you know, you're doing sales, he's doing sales, she's doing this, like everybody's doing everything. Eventually, 
hopefully the business will settle down and people will take on proper roles and responsibilities and there'll be a, a, an org chart and a reporting structure. Um, and that can be a pretty painful thing, making that transition. So I think it's important at the outset to really think about who's going to do what, what you're going to get paid for it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with there being a passive investor if they don't really contribute more than that to the business. And so really be clear about who gets what and, and how, you know, and, 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 and Tracy will likely talk about it, but, you know, in addition to the shareholders agreement, if somebody's going to be the working partner and the other's more of a passive partner, there should also likely be an employment agreement in place as well to define what your rights are as an employee. Um, as you go into a, uh, a business together, there's questions of obligations and risk. Uh, personal guarantees at the bank are a good example. Um, you know, if you guys go and sign jointly and severally, and your partner incurs liabilities, uh, you're also responsible for them. So you've got to be very clear in your legal arrangements as to who gets to commit the company, who's responsible for it, who has check signing authority, and so forth. Um, also, there's some significant business decisions that will arise from time to time. Um, you know, is it based on 51, 49 percent of vote? Do people have certain number of directors on the board? Um, do you need a veto? Over, do you get a veto over certain decisions like admitting new uh, investors or uh, buying a business or selling a business or, you know, what constitutes a major decision that's going to require unanimous approval or some sort of veto or perhaps two-thirds. It depends on how many people and really what the situation is. But these are some, you know, pretty critical things that you don't think of and then something comes up and you have no arrangement in place to help guide you in terms of how these decisions are made. So once you've dived in and you're in bed and you're a partner, uh, and you've signed your shareholders agreement or partnership agreement, um, then it's all about the care and feeding of this relationship. And, um, you know, it's funny, often when you ask partners, they, they sometimes have slightly different visions of what the business is about. So I'm a very strong advocate of regular strategic planning sessions, both at the ownership level or the key stakeholder level and then also at the employee level so that that vision gets drilled down and the culture of the business really gets determined from above. But you as partners have to get it together at the outset and figure out what that vision is. And so, you know, go through that strategic planning process, uh, do an annual retreat, uh, get off site, no cell phones, no interruptions, closed door sessions. Uh, spend the time. Um, you know, marriage counselors tell you to do it in your marriage. Well, you should also do it in your partnership. Um, performance reviews. Hold yourselves to the same level of criteria and uh, oversight as you would a key employee because, again, you're wearing two hats. You're not just an owner, but you're also an employee with responsibility. So, you know, figure out what the uh, key performance uh, indicators are and make them smart and measurable and uh, hold, your, hold each other to account, especially if your compensation is somehow uh, differentiated based on uh, performance-based criteria, commissions or percentage of revenue or whatever you might do. Um, you know, if you're a minority partner in a business, you don't have much in the way of rights unless you get them in a shareholders agreement. So there's all sorts of rights that you want to make sure that you have in terms of uh, information about the business, uh, financial statements, quarterly statements, budgets, um, you're the business plan and so on. It's one thing if you're operating the business, but if you're the outside partner or a minority partner, you may not get that information as of right and you may you know, have a lot of your net worth invested in this opportunity and you're really just going along for the ride. So at this point I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Tracy. As you heard, uh, Tracy is a partner at our firm. Uh, she's very experienced in these matters, has worked with many different companies in different uh, industries with a, a real interest in life sciences and, and others of course. 
Um, and I'll turn it over to Tracy at this point to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the legal issues that arise in partnerships. Thanks so much, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, no surprise, my first slide will say, get it in writing. I'm the lawyer in the room. And it's very important if you spend all this time doing all those things that Jeff said, analyzing your values, your expectations, your intentions, that you crystallize those in a binding agreement so that when you do have an issue later on, you both have a document to, to look at and to guide your, your uh, uh, dispute. Um, it's, it's very important that you customize the agreement to your situation. Some people will borrow the one from their brother or their friend or find one on the internet. It might be a starting point, but it will probably not reflect everything that you've discussed and that you need. Just like Jeff has been discussing, it's a bit like a, a marriage. When, when you start to get into this discussion and, and, and set up your prenup, you'll start to assess your bargaining power. You'll start to assess uh, what's important to you and what's important to your partner because those are the types of things w w that might stick. One of the things that will be interesting is whether the provisions will be mutual. If there's just two of you, if there's more than you, it'll be different. But if there's just two of you, you'll have equal provisions potentially. And so what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So you're, you're negotiating with yourself so it becomes a bit more of a fair agreement. In some ways, it's easier to actually negotiate those. When you have... Um, uh, unequal bargaining power or someone with you know more financial resources and, and, and less involvement in the in the structure then there's going to be more discussion about decision making and those types of things as you go forward it's always important and this is difficult to anticipate both your current and your future needs Am I going on? No, <laughs> I need a box <laughs> Address, uh, anticipate both your current needs and your future needs. It's very easy right now to say, okay, tomorrow I know what I'm going to do and, and, and how we want to set this up. But try and, try and vision, try and think about down the path where you might be and what you might need, and, and particularly whether you're going to need future investors because they're going to want to look at your organization, see how you've set up from a governance perspective, and see how difficult it will be for them to come into that organization. It could actually be quite negative if it's too complicated. And obviously, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So I'm going to go through these key issues, which I, I think are important to set up in your uh, uh, partnership agreement, whether that's a partnership agreement or a shareholder agreement or other type of joint venture arrangement. Um, one of the key issues is the legal form of the relationship, because that will drive some of the drafting. The contributions of each partner, both financially and otherwise. The compensation of the partners. The right to information. Your decision making. Controlling who your partner is today and in the future. You know going in who your partner is, but things could change over time. Restricting what your partner does, remembering that could also apply to yourself, and, and exit options. So the very first slide talks about the legal form of the relationship, and it, it will really depend on how you're structuring this from, a, from a, a legal perspective. You could be general partners in a general partnership. You could be shareholders in a corporation. That may be determinative of the types of things that you can, you can put in your contract or that you can contract out of. Things like limits on liability are sometimes governed by the statute or common law. Things like your duties to your partner. There's common law, common law duties of good faith. You, could, you can't just contract out of those types of things. Decision making. The corporate statutes provide shareholders with certain fundamental rights. So you can't necessarily contract out of those, but you can deal with those through voting arrangements and things like that. And then obviously when you're structuring this, this is not my area of expertise, but there's tax implications on how you structure whether you're going to be a partner or a shareholder, particularly with respect to distributions out of those um, uh, partnerships. Then I think it's important in your agreement to set up the contributions of each partner and determine how they are valued and what the consideration for those contributions are. So those could include tangible or intangible off, uh, assets. It could include your intellectual property that you're contributing, or it could include your desk and your computer. Obviously, your financial equity and your sweat equity that uh, Jeff spoke about, the types of services that you're going to provide. Are you providing those in, in exchange for uh, uh, an interest in the partnership, or, or is there going to be a different consideration for that, like cash? And then how do you value those? How are you valuing the three-year-old computer that's being contributed? How are you valuing the intellectual property that's being contributed? You both will have to decide, or the, the, the number of partners will have to decide on their value, and you may even need a third party to help you determine that. The capital requirements are really important because, again, this is one of those things that you need to anticipate now and in the future. And, and how the, those will be funded, and who will determine the timing and terms. Will you, you as partners all have a say in whether more capital is required and how that capital will be obtained, whether it's through a loan or through additional capital calls? You may set up your partnership so that you know, once, in the, uh, once a year for the first five years, each of you has to contribute $10,000 to keep uh, some general capital in the partnership. 
What happens if your partner doesn't comply with that provision? Are they out of the partnership? How do you deal with that? How do you make a meaningful um, repercussion for your partner? Remembering that could actually apply to you as well if you don't have your, of your contribution in. And how does that impact your relative ownership? Will it, will it impact your decision making because you lose, you lose your majority ownership if you haven't made your contribution and your partner has? And it's always important, I think, to provide for preemptive rights, and that's the right to participate in future offerings. So if you want to bring in third parties in, in, in the future into your organization to help with the financing, you want to have the right to participate in those financing. So you, may, you maintain your percentage interest. You don't get diluted through the process. You, you oftentimes may have to just because of the bargaining power of your, um, your financer, but uh, it's something to think about. <coughs> Compensation is very important. You've, you've got this money in, you've, you've contributed your assets, you've contributed your capital, presumably you're contributing services. How are you going to be paid for those services? It goes a little bit to what Jeff was speaking about. Will you be an employee? Will you be an, a, a consultant? Or are you going to be compensated just as a, as a shareholder or a partner of this organization? So kind of more through dividends. Perhaps there's going to be cash and non-cash compensation. Perhaps there's an option program that you're going to build into place. And it's nice to have those things. It's a lot to do at the very beginning, but to have some of those things settled at, up front because it deals with, again, it ties nicely into what Jeff was saying. You create your performance uh, review system, the things that matter to you, and then, and then build options and other rewards based on that type of uh, performance. Obviously, you'll, you'll need to seek uh, tax advice with respect to the implications of the different forms of compensation. Getting a salary is very different than getting a dividend. And then you all, always will need to balance the need for compensation with your capital requirements of the organization. You may not be able to afford a salary uh, in your first couple of years, so you'll have to sort that out as partners, how each of you is, is going to be paid and, and uh, survive. As Jeff said, it's very important that you also document the type of types of information that you'll need from the business. Certainly as a shareholder or certain uh, partnerships, you'll, you'll have right to, to access certain types of information about the organization, but not all, all, not all of the information. As Jeff said, if in the beginning days you're very involved with the organization, you'll probably have your hands in a lot of things and you'll have access to these things. But if you're a minority partner or you're not as involved, you're a silent partner, you may not, you may not have these things cross your desk. So you'll want to make sure that you've got access uh, to them and most importantly, I think, is the financial statements, uh, the annual business plan and budget, if you're not involved with that, and any variations from that where you're off budget, tax information because you, for your own tax reporting, minute books and corporate records that will set out the types of decisions that the board has made, whether you're part of the board or not. You can, uh, you can have a sense of how those decisions have been made. And then information regarding disputes, litigation, or proceedings because you may be liable for some of those, so it's important that you have uh, uh, both notice that, that they're occurring and then information with respect to the merits. It's also important that you have several of those things after you leave the partnership, uh, particularly if you leave the partnership and there's a continuing dispute where you might be brought in uh, as a witness or as a, as a defendant, you want to make sure you'll still have continuing access to some of that information. Similarly with financials and tax information that, that may, if you get audited in three years, that you still have access to that type of information because they may, not, they, don't, they may not put it in your boxes on your driveway. <laughs> Decision making is key. This is, this is one where um, uh, a lot of time is usually spent when, you, when you're first sorting out a partnership arrangement. Who, is going to make the who are going to make the strategic decisions? Will there be a, a kind of a governing body? If it's just two of you, perhaps it's the two of you. If there's more of you, then you need to determine who, who, who are going to have the right to make strategic decisions as well as operational decisions. And you have to be careful because there, you get to a point where you're so involved with decision making that you're actually not running the business. So when you're, when you're assessing whether you need to be involved with every type of decision, really, really decide whether it's important to you or not or whether it's something that you can properly delegate and have reported to you on a regular basis. As, as Jeff mentioned, there are some decisions that, that you typically would put in kind of that upper basket of significant decisions and you, you can structure them, uh, the decision-making power, the way it, it, the, whatever makes the most sense for you and your organization, whether it, it requires unanimous approval of all partners, so you effectively get a veto, whether it just requires you know, two-thirds approval of the board or a prescribed quorum that includes you because it's an important issue for you. And here are some examples of those types of decisions that might be relevant, but you should think, again, in your circumstances, what's more, most important to you both now and in the future. Things like capital expenditures of a certain dollar amount. Can your partner go and sign uh, a contract for a significant capital expenditure without your involvement? 
obviously the termination or the sale of your underlying business, uh, the declaration of dividends, taking money out of your partnership. Who, who uh, has the right to approve that? Borrowings and guarantees. As Jeff mentioned, sometimes uh, when you borrow from a bank, it will require that both partners sign on or that there's a guarantee of the entity and you might be liable for that. Uh, significant contracts and signing authority. Who can sign your bank, your checks? Approval of the annual business plan and budget is very important if you're a significant partner that you're part of that process and you're part of any changes to those uh, documents. Obviously, any fundamental transactions and any transfer of your ownership, uh, of someone's ownership interest or addition of a new partner. You want to make sure you're involved. And that kind of leads me to my next slide, uh, which is titled Control Who Your Partner Is. Because things change over time and you may, you may enter into an agreement where you and a partner have decided that this is your relationship and, and you're each shareholders in the uh, corporation. But your, sh your partner wants to transfer to their sister or to a friend or for some other person. Do you want to restrict that act of transfer of their interest? Because otherwise you may have a partner that you weren't expecting. You also want to protect in your agreement for transfers of assets, assets by statute. If your partner uh, is an individual, not a corporation, and they die or they become disabled or, or, or go through a divorce, there could be a transfer of those assets that isn't contemplated by your agreement because it happens by, by law. As an example, by death, the, their assets will go to their, their estate. Usually we try and build into the, the contract some sort of protection me mechanism so if there is a death then you can, then you can call back that uh, share so that it's, it's not in a third party's hands, it's back within the company. Of course the company needs to be able to fund that purchase. So sometimes you also get uh, key man insurance for those types of situations. You also want to consider indirect transfers. If, if there's two partners in a partnership and you're both corporations, there could be an indirect transfer of the ownership because there's a change of control. So they're not technically transferring the ownership interest, but there's a new shareholder at the corporate level. So you're effectively being, uh, becoming a partner with someone you weren't expecting. So you want to be careful for that. Also consider the ability to pledge your shares or your partnership interest. If you pledge those to support your own personal loan on your house or something like that, and, and you cannot pay that loan, the bank could force against you, and then the bank becomes a partner. Maybe not, maybe not your ideal partner. And always consider the ability to add a new partner just generally, whether you can um, have preemptive rights and, uh, and other protections to maintain your interest. Then think a little bit about uh, restricting what your partner does. This again is a double-edged sword because this can, if, if they're mutual provisions, it will also apply against you. But they're, they're general provisions that you would expect a partner who's interested in your business to comply with. And that would be non-competition. That they're not, they don't have a side business that competes with your business, that's taking, that's taking clients away from your business or, or, or setting up IP that's competitive with your business. Similarly, a non-solicit that they're not taking in their side business your customers or your employees, um, your clients or suppliers. And that might be one that, that, that survives the termination of your arrangement so that after they leave, they can't immediately take all your customers and employees uh, and start up a new, uh, a new shop. Confidentiality is sometimes implied depending on the types of organization, but you know, clearly you don't want certain information with respect to your business uh, made public, so you, you, you can provide for confidentiality requirements. And then dispute resolution, it, it's, it's, it's hard to anticipate every situation that you're going to get into, so there, there may be a time where you do get into a dispute. And just think a little bit about how you can anticipate that and what you might include. And it might be that you're restricted to something like arbitration, so it's not in a public forum like a court or an expensive forum like a court. Arbitration can be expensive sometimes too, but uh, just try and, and think a little bit about some of those factors. And then exit. Unfortunately, there, there is a time where you, may, where you or your partner no longer wants to be part of the business or, or can't afford to be part of the business. They can't make their capital contribution. So it's important to, to establish different exit mechanisms. Unless you, your contract actually provides for it, you may not be able to sell your interest to a third party or to your <coughs> partner or buy out your partner. You'll have to negotiate that at the time. So you'll, you'll want to consider now whether that's appropriate for you. And anticipate the worst. Anticipate the Jeff Dennis situation where you've just, 20 years in, you've said, this is not working. We've got to separate somehow and anticipate that that's, that's a possibility. Oops. Sorry. So here are some different exit options. Um, I'll go through them in a bit more detail. But there's a right to transfer with a right of first refusal. 
the piggyback or drag along rights, a put cell option, and then the, the classic shotgun. Would you mind explaining the last two? Yes, I'll go through them all actually oh. for you. Yep. So the right of first refusal, if you don't know, it's, it's uh, if you want to sell your interest to a third party, before you do that, you have to offer your partner the right to buy that interest. So not all agreements will allow for this. Some, some do, some don't. But it, uh, sometimes it's triggered if a third party, a, a bona fide third party, so it can't be your sister, comes to you and says, I want to buy your interest, then you offer that up to your other partner and say, would you like to, would you like to uh, take it before I sell it to the third party? Or if not, I'm going to bring the third party into the partnership. It's one of those things you may not permit. You may just say, there's no transfers without my consent. And the piggyback and drag along rights are c kind of as their name implies. So if one partner, the piggyback, if one partner offers to sell its interest to a third party, the other party, partner can piggyback on that offer. So if there's a third party waiting in the wings, wants to buy one interest, then you can say, I also want to get out. You have to buy both of ours on the same terms and conditions or there's no deal for anybody. That, that improves, it, 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 it ensures that you don't get a partner that you don't want. Clearly improves the liquidity if you're a minority but uh, it can limit your liquidity if you're the majority partner because somebody may not want to buy the entire business or can't afford to. The drag along right is kind of the opposite. So if one partner wants to sell its interest, it can compel the other partners to, to sell their interest to that third party on the same term, terms and condition. If you're that second partner, you could be forced to sell when you're not interested. So put call rights. Are, are not unusual and, and these are sometimes the ones that are used when you've got the statutory situations like a death or, or divorce um, but a put right is just when one partner requires the other partner to buy its interest in the organization and the call rights are when one, when one partner requires the other partner to sell its interest and that's usually upon things like the death or the insolvency so as soon as that event happens then, then that, that uh, security can be acquired back and, and back within the hands of kind of the, the partners. A, an important part of these is valuing the, the asset that, that's being, uh, uh, or the security that's being sold. So you need to have a mechanism to determine value. And this, this sometimes takes time in the agreement. Sometimes the agreements are quite simple, and you just provide for a third-party valuator that will come in and help assess. Sometimes it's based on your financial statements, things like that. Again, you'll have to think a little bit about your organization and how, how that might work. And that might change over time. And then the shotgun. This is basically, you know, this is, this is, we're at the end of the road, we're, this is our final dis dis dispute and we're at a complete deadlock, there's no way to deal with this. So one partner notifies the other partner, there's two things that can happen. This is the price I'm willing to buy or sell my interest, what would you like to do? Would you like to buy it or would you like to sell your interest? And then, and then there's only one partner that remains. You can do it with multiple partners, but it's typically uh, uh, with, when there's two partners. Uh, it may not be optimal if partners have unequal financial resources because one partner can, can maybe clearly buy the other partners where the other partner may not have the resources to actually maintain its interest in the partner partnership. Sometimes you'll also require a minimum price or some sort of valuation in order to make sure that that's, that's fair and that's not being done in an unfair way. But because of the shotgun mechanism, you know it's, it's, it's again, it's a goose for the gander. It's, it's somewhat a, of a fair mechanism. So Tracy, are these often layered? Yes, you'll often have more than one, yeah. Put call doesn't work, somebody's not interested, yeah. they can't come up with the money, then you yeah. go to option two. Or well, it depends, uh, yeah, because if you have a put call, then you'll want to be able to enforce that. So it, it, it depends on the, the situation. But yeah, there, there, it's not unusual to have more than one option within an agreement. And it might be for different, different deadlock situations. Yes. So you might have the put call when you have a death and you don't use it in any other situation and then you may have this just really when you're at the end of your you know you, you must go to arbitration first and if you can't get to arbitration then you go to shotgun depends on, on how many layers you want to how, how, how long you want to try and so in summary uh, I think you need to think about when you're when you're determining your partnership relationships do you really want a partner Jeff made some really good points to think through is this the right, do you need a partner and is this the right partner for you? Do you align with respect to values and, and, and ideas with respect to your business and, and your, your, your roles, your responsibilities, and your expectations? Define all of those in a, in a binding agreement so that you have that going forward. Make sure that you maintain your communication amongst your partners through, through regular uh, reviews and retreats. Continually do your annual plan. I think that's a really important process. Really think about controlling who your partner is, both today and in the future. And make sure that you think a little bit about the worst case scenario and plan for some exit options out of the partnership if you need to. OK, 
Okay, I think that's all for today. Let us know if you have any questions. I forgot to mention that um, I have two copies of my book that we've brought, and so we're going to award them to the person or persons who have the best question. <laughs> okay? So, and Tracy Just and I by will, us, yeah. yeah we're, we're the sole <laughs> judges and jury, and uh, so uh, fire away. Well, first, you have that in writing. <laughs> Well, a, a question for you. I mean, sure. I, uh, I see a lot more partnerships being formed in these economic times because people don't have the resources or can't find the resources willing to take on the business risk. Are you seeing more partnerships set up intentionally to be on a short-term basis or a temporary basis? And do those look much different than partnerships where you say, don't know where the end is. We know how to get out of it, but we don't know when that's going to happen. I haven't really seen a trend that way, and I certainly, when I'm, I'm working with a client, I would anticipate that it's going to be longer than they, they expect, so that you would probably kind of create the partnership in the same light. You, wouldn't, you would want to anticipate a long term, but I haven't actually seen that, that trend. I don't know if Some you... things that are more transactional, so for example, if you're a real estate developer and you've got a plot of land and you might you know, yes. partner with somebody in a specific situation, yeah. um, I mean, I spent some time in the solar uh, energy development business. And that was very common, where you know, you'd have a specific joint venture on a specific project. It was a lot of money. It was a big project, and you need a couple partners to make it happen. So that would be more of a short-term kind of situation. But you're going into it with that expectation. So the whole arrangement is really, you know, a development agreement, and you know who does what and who gets what when it's sold, and, and so on. So it's it's slightly different. Uh, you may not even be, you know, shareholders or partners per se. Um, it just depends or on project based. It's project yeah. based. Yeah. I mean, I work in the life sciences field, so there are there are clearly stages of development of assets mm -hmm. where a partner that can help you in, in development, for example, may have no role or interest in commercialization downstream. So you normally structure that as some kind of license agreement or whatever at this stage. But I'm, I'm just curious whether you might enter into a partnership through that phase and then figure out how to buy it out. I haven't seen much of it yet. No, yeah, I think you're probably in a better shape if you do the licensing. There's probably a little less that you need to worry about um, if they're not kind of an equity, an equity partner. You know, one thing that you should also think about, and it's it's a, maybe a little bit related, but it, you know, at different stages in the growth of the business, you need different skills. Mm -hmm. So as that occurs, you may find that you need somebody to leave or change their role. And so again, that's one of those things that you've got to think about at the outset and, and build in in terms of these agreements because, you know, if the guy's the CEO, but he's good in a company from zero to ten, yep. and you've got to bring in, I mean, I'm dealing with a situation right now with one of the companies that I've uh, been involved with where, you know, the, it's a huge success story. The guy took it from zero to about 50 million in revenue, and so, but he's been financed by VC investors. And they've said, you know, you've done your thing, step aside, you can be chief cheerleader, chief visionary, chief something, but we need a guy that knows how to take this business. And by the way, when I say guy, I mean guy and gal. Um, but take the business to, you know, a billion dollars or whatever it is. And so at first, you know, he was really upset and, you know, took it personally and didn't really know how to deal with it. But then after really thinking about it, He's now, his big project is hiring a successor, and he's pumped about it, and he's got a, a role, and so on. But, you know, you've got to try and deal with it, and how you're going to uh, navigate through that when the time comes. Um, so what if you develop a partnership with the idea of eventually, you know, having an acquisition of that specific product, um, and at the same time you're being offered uh, services in exchange for the partnership? How, like, if that's going to continue with the acquisition, how would you like structure a beneficial partnership, you know, moving ahead with that? I'm not sure I understand the question. So are you saying that somebody's going to put some sort of property in as a contribution? So you've invented a widget and so you're going to put that into the business and somebody's going to put money? So to begin with, it's more of an integration between two products. Uh, so starting with a partnership with the idea of eventually acquiring that product of your partner. So uh, if the if the you know the, the person you're working with is offering you services, and in when you acquire their product, they're going to offer continue to offer those services. How do you 
create a partnership that can work that long term? I mean, it depends on whether they need any equity, but I mean, ideally, they're an employee. Yeah, like if, if you. Oh, if they're looking for equity, then it, then it's a bit more difficult. I mean, then then you are going to be partners, and you're going to go through that type of a process, yeah. where you have to sort out kind of the relative uh, contributions, and uh, you know the acquisition is a later stage. I think you're right to anticipate that, yeah. but uh, um, the key, I think, in that situation, if you're going to be kind of the ultimate owner of the product, is to try and ma maintain control. Yeah. And also, you know, people's expectations sometimes are out of line with their contribution, and it may be that what you should be doing is bringing them in as a key employee with some sort of you know options or you know right other type of compensation so give them some stock options so that if the company takes off they can you know get a big lift and you see that all the time in Silicon Valley where they're not owners and they're contributing but they're getting sort of that big equity kicker because you know they've given up salary or they took the risk of coming into a situation that's you know, newer, and so they gave up that you know regular paycheck to go into a situation where they might take less money, and you know if the company doesn't survive, they might have nothing. Yeah. So for that, they get you know less salary, but some kind of equity care. Interestingly, it's an agency, so it's a different model altogether, and they're bigger than us. But we want to establish the acquisition of their product. You know, we can always talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just on that point, we want to be careful too when you're providing equity options because those turn into equity and they become shareholders or partners. So you want to again go through all those exit mechanics so that you can actually get them out if you need to get them out in the future. Sorry, I, I think you might be in the next. Uh, what kind of partnership agreement do to protect a minority partner where the majority partner is involved with international business that could involve paying uh, contract helping money or things which I think in North America we would call a bribe, but it's just sort of greasing the wheels and accepted business in other countries. Well, you want to be very careful about getting into a partnership where you may have some liability for that in particular, um, because that's not necessarily personal liability to the person that's doing the bribing. Um, I, would, I would have covenants from each of the partners to say they'll comply with law. You know, and you'll want to be, you know, to the extent that you can be involved with those types of activities and really understand you know, SNC obviously knows all about mm -hmm. this, but you know, to get it up to the board level, understand what the process was to develop a contract in a certain country, make sure you understand what payments were made, and kind of understand what each one was uh, was allocated to. But that's yeah. But it's also be a fundamental question. I mean, if you're worried about this person's integrity, it's what I'm talking about at the beginning about gut feel. Like, you know, that if you have that question mark going in, then it's you know maybe it's not the right person. And having that covenant, you, you have to sue on it. So you do have to remember just having them promise to do it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll comply. You'll still have to sue to, to, to get your damages. So it is a tricky situation. Do you be better off as an employee or a consultant Probably. as opposed to being a partner? Yeah, if you're, depending on the way your arrangement's structured. I mean, if you're a limited partner, you may not have that liability associated with your investment. But if, if not, you may have personal liability. So you'll want to look into that. Sorry. Often it's useful when thinking through these kind of questions to see how other people thought through their questions, right? And that's everything through what what's important and, and how do people address them to setting the expectations that you were talking about, what is what is normative, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and managing people's expectations. So uh, do you guys can you suggest places to find case studies where we can see mm, the thought process of, of how people work? Well, there are peer groups. Uh, so, for example, well, he's gone, but sitting here a couple minutes ago, uh, Warren Bongard, who's the president of the Toronto chapter of the Entrepreneurs' Organization. Uh, he was sitting in the back a few minutes ago. But there are organizations like EO, Entrepreneurs' Organization, and uh, I mean some others that are maybe a little bigger and smaller that are peer-to-peer learning situations and I would look at that. The other thing, if you want to give me your card at the end, I can probably find things like annotated shareholders agreements. Those types of things are sometimes helpful because then, you know, it might be more complicated than you need, but it almost goes through all these types of examples. And you can say, oh, yes, that works. No, it doesn't. And they typically have a little bit of a description as to why, you, what, what considerations you have in each type of... The, the other resource, uh, I mean, Mars has some terrific stuff on their website and it's archived. In fact, this presentation will be archived both in terms of the PowerPoint, but also uh, the audio and visual. Uh, and video, and then I think there's going to be sort of an edited, uh, shorter version. So there's lots of resources at Mars, but also uh, the Kauffman Foundation, um, 
down in the States, I forget their website, but you can Google it. They are a fairly substantial foundation who's solely targeted entrepreneurial education. And they've got articles and precedents, and there's just a tremendous amount of resources available there. How do you spell that? K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, for startups, obviously, time is of the essence. On average, um, best case scenario, how long would it take to start the process of forming a binding agreement to execution? And obviously, along the way, there probably will be some red flags that probably will give you indications maybe to leave that partnership as yeah. well. So can you um, maybe talk a bit about that, um, just as a guideline? Sure. I mean, that really depends on the nature of the partners, how aligned they are, how many of you there are, and whether you are um, equal partners. Because I think sometimes, as I said earlier, the, the mutual agreements are sometimes the easiest. You still have to get to an agreement, but you, you know, you're just drafting it from a shareholder's perspective. And when you have different, uh, different percentage interests or, or decision making, then I think it takes a little bit longer. Uh, geez. Um, there, I don't know that there's an average. I mean, what, what I normally do is actually go through a, a checklist like that with a client when they first come in or a group of clients when they first come in. So it all, sometimes depends on how quickly that can get turned around and get their initial feedback. And it takes you know a few sessions together to talk it through. The drafting actually isn't as, as complicated sometimes as the decision making. But you know, weeks. Well, you, you can <laughs> take off, you know, when this is up on the website, you know, take it as a checklist, sit down with your partners and kind of go through some of the issues. And the better prepared you are in terms of what you, you know, knowing what you want, the faster it gets turned around. Definitely. Yes. I promise. Oh, sorry. To, yeah. I promise. Um, in, a, in a startup, uh, in the early stage of a startup, when you have uh, several shareholders, for example, four, uh, how do you? Or what are the best practices for contribution? For how do you evaluate who's contributing what, and uh, compensate uh, whether in shareholders uh, were, were they issuing shares or future stock options. So how would you evaluate the partner's contribution and uh, their compensation? Yeah, I mean, that really, I think, goes a bit back to what you were talking say about. I was going to you. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, That's, but, uh, you get a book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But, st you know, starting Maybe. back, thinking a little Maybe bit it's about... <laughs> no, the, uh, you know, it's... It's always a tough question. I mean, it's one of those questions that you can only answer by saying it depends, right? It depends on the situation. It depends on bargaining powers we've talked about. I mean, it just depends on a lot of stuff. There are, in some industries, some benchmarks. Um, you know, businesses are worth three times this or one times EBITDA or, you know, so, or, you know, there are some sort of benchmarks that are industry-based, but it's really hard in a vacuum. If it's sweat equity, well, you, you know, then everybody's working just as hard. Um, well, you can look at comparable salaries. I mean, I think it goes back to what you were saying when you're de developing your business plan and figuring out what are the key performance uh, matrix for you, what, what, what is important to the development of your business and the success of it. Are those the types of things that you're going to reward and they get a better reward than, you know, some general kind of office admin work, you know. It, it is, though, I think, really customized to the situation. But when you're doing it, think a little bit about are you issuing shares? Are you, interesting, are, are you issuing interest in your business that will change the dynamic of the decision making? Is it better to give them some other type of consideration that won't change kind of your funding? It could be other types of considerations. You can get some sort of phantom type equity so that it has a, has a link to the value of your business, but it isn't actually equity. You could just get plain old cash bonuses, those types of things. So they have different tax implications, but they will protect your kind of governance structure um, from, the, from the outset. You, oh, you can get non-voting shares too. That might be an option. So you could get something that's non-voting, but that has an economic value. I'm working on a first startup, and right now I'm working with a partner, and it's the two of us. And um, you know, right now, as, as the revenues uh, start coming in, and uh, obviously we have to register uh, the business, and my partner is saying to have it incorporated because that way, you know, in terms of liability, you know, there's also personally. Would you recommend like legal-wise partnership or, or incorporation with just two people? That one really depends on your on your entire kind of plan, and, and it's very important to bring a tax person into that discussion because getting the money out of the organization will be tax driven. Certainly, from a liability perspective, you're right. It, it's better to be a shareholder in a corporation unless unless you're taking on a lot of the responsibility of the board, and you might still have some liability. Partnerships should probably have more liability, but partnerships. 
interest. Personal liability. Partnerships are quick and easy to, to organize, though, but they both, you know, you're going to kind of go through the same thing. Either you're going to have a shareholder agreement for a corporation as shareholders, or you're going to have a partnership agreement. So you're still going to go through all those types of activities. So think about liability. Think about uh, contributions, how you make contributions to an entity, and then how do you get that money out from a tax and accounting perspective. Also, if it's a technology situation, you may have multiple layers where you hold your patents or something. So it's just another consideration. Think about the liability. Is there, is there a potential liability associated with it? Is it important then to have uh, some sort of protection and be in a corporation? Think a little bit about that. And then, and then if you can, talk to your accountant or a tax person that can help you understand the, the differences personally on, on you know, if, you've, if you're at a commercial stage of your product and you want to get that money out, what the best way to do it. And then, you'll, again, you'll want to anticipate both today and in the future. Uh, although you can switch from a partnership to a corporation over time, if you'd like. Any questions? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, if you don't have the proper paperwork in place, um, so if you were trying to work lean and fast, are there certain like default protections or rights that are kind of protected under the law or without paperwork there's nothing? Like if you can show through emails that it was one person's idea or those types of things. If it gets messy. It's not ideal. From an evidentiary perspective, you obviously want to have as much as you can documented in a proper form. Um, th those all help, so keep them if you can, but uh, it's, it's, it's just not going to be, it's going to be a he said, she said type of battle when you ever came down to a dispute over who owns the intellectual property. There are some protections. Yeah, no, just in, in, in general, I was wondering if there's like default protections. There are default protections, yes. So things like the corporate statute provides certain uh, protections to shareholders. They have rights to certain information, rights to vote on certain fundamental transactions, those types of things. There's common law protections for partnerships, like the, the common law duty of, of good faith. So there are some inherent protections, but they won't get you the specific, um, the specific elements we've talked about today. If I can build on this gentleman's question at the beginning about how to divide up equity between the, the partners. Um, in setting up a partnership some years ago, one of the things that we wrestled with was whether to divide up all of the equity between the partners right at the beginning or to reserve a substantial piece of the equity to be earned by the partners in return for the amount of what equity they actually invested over time. Do you have any thoughts on that? It makes it a little more complicated. I mean, it's a more complicated agreement, but mm -hmm. it's a good idea. Um, you can also issue shares out of Treasury. So, I mean, you, you know, so long as you've got enough authorized. Well, presumably that's what they'll be doing, I think, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't issue them without having the actual recipient yet. Mm -hmm. it, it goes to the same points, though, I think, as we've talked about. It's going to change your, um, your ownership interest over time. You may deal with that through your contract so that you still have, uh, you know, unanimous uh, approval requirements for the key de decisions. But... Yeah. It could be that the person that puts in the most sweat equity becomes a majority partner. <coughs> yes, and that was the issue we wrestled with yeah. as we got down the road. Yeah. We realized it might be okay. It might be okay because they've contributed more. But yeah, you, you just want to. And this may seem simplistic, but don't forget, you know, ownership percentage and power can be unrelated. In other words, you can have a minority with a contract. With, yeah. a, with <laughs> yeah. a contract. Yeah. So you can have a minority interest, but you can have all sorts of powers or rights or veto rights if you have a contract. And you had another question? Yes. Uh, what could be or, or what would be uh, most common uh, roadblocks in shareholder agreements and roadblocks for equity investors like angels or VCs that are coming up in the future? Yeah, angels won't like uh, a lot of these terms uh, that, that might be used against them. But uh, I mean, the typical roadblocks, I think uh, probably the decision making, the powers there, that whether they're unanimous or not. Uh, the exit options, although again, it, it depends on your situation. If they're mutual, then, then they're sometimes you know faster to resolution. Um, trying to think of uh, the transfer restrictions. Some people will want to have the right to transfer to another corporation, or they may not want to have restrictions on the change of control of their corporation and things like that. So, it really goes back to the kind of the the, the bargaining position of the people and what they value the most. You know what's most important to them. They want they want an absolute right to to transfer or pledge their units. That's where they're going to dig their heels in. Somebody else wants the absolute power to make uh, certain types of decisions. That's where they all dig their heels in. And again, this will be a whole kind of prenup type process where you'll learn a little bit about your partners. But the other thing to keep in mind is that this is all 
great when it's between yourselves. As soon as you bring in a third party financier, whether it's a VC or angel or whatever, and particularly if they're sophisticated, you know, this whole arrangement that you've negotiated could be tossed out and yeah, starting from scratch. They will bring in their form of agreement and, you know, be a new sheriff in town. Yeah. And so you can try and anticipate, you know, some of the things that m might be beneficial when they come along, but if they don't like it, they'll, 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 let, you their, know. they'll <laughs> let you know. And so sometimes the advice is to keep it simple if that's the route you're going because you're gonna, they're going to throw it out anyhow. One of you mentioned that uh, the equity of the ownership should be given uh, based on, you know, who puts the most work or you know, the sweat equity, right? But if you give someone who at this stage, like a different stage of the business, <coughs> works less and you give them the minority ownership of the business, don't you box that person in and, and then would that, uh, you know, kind of like hinder the relationship? Uh, because in, in the future that person could be working more on the business but then you already boxed him or her, you know, you, you get the minority. And it could. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I, I think you really have to customize it to the situation. I mean, ideally, you deal with it in the contract so that they still, if, if they happen to be a minority, they still have decision making. Or you value contributions in a different way. You could set up a corporation where nobody contributes anything on, the, on day one so that you have equal shareholding, but then the corporation has to somehow figure out how to acquire those interests or to pay for that sweat equity over time. It's it, the, one of the cheapest things you can issue at the beginning is securities, right? You don't need to, you can issue a share in exchange for, for something of value. So it really depends on what the financial resources of the group is, I think. And then again, when, when you've got a minority shareholder, it doesn't mean that they don't have decision-making power. It doesn't mean they don't have veto rights. They just have to make sure they get those into the agreement. I, I also, and I'm, I'm, I wonder if you agree, but I also like to have a clear distinction between ownership and employment. Right, so you know, you're starting by what you contribute, so you're valued on that basis. Okay, so that's what you own, and you have all sorts of rights and so on relating to that based on the shareholders agreement. But now you're wearing a different hat. You're the CEO or you're the CTO or you're director of marketing or whatever it is you do. You will have, you should have some sort of employment arrangement that values that contribution. And it could be salary, could be commission, could be stock options, could be all sorts of bells and whistles that create an incentive. So you're worried about a disincentive. He's only got a minority interest, it's not going to work that hard. But you can create you know, a situation where you can truly motivate somebody by giving them that carrot and rewarding them for the contributions through you know, a different employment arrangement. Again, it goes to the resources of the entity, whether you've got the cash to do that or whether it becomes a, a stock option or other type of uh, incentive. When it comes to written agreements, your company uh, that you work for, do you guys help out with that? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems with like valuations is once you state it on paper, it's like almost legally binding now. So it's uh, if you depending on your stock option, you'll have to uh, mention it as like a, a tax. Uh, you might have to tax. It might be taxed because <coughs> it's a state benefit. Uh, depending on whether it's like a clawback or like whatever the stock option may be, is there a specific sh like type of shareholders agreement you would recommend to avoid that problem, or would you recommend just notionally mentioning the valuation with whoever's investing? I'm not sure if I exactly understand your question. So the valuation of the company at the very beginning? Right. So if like if you just state the valuation to an investor as opposed to writing it down, then it's not taxable at that rate, that valuation rate. I think you're confusing situations where people are given stock in kind versus an option. Yeah, well, yeah options. Right, but my understanding, and I don't, I don't want to be giving tax advice here, but my understanding, the reason they use options is that there is no uh, value at the time because it's, it, it's, it's the value at that moment, so it's, you know, we'll call it out of the money, right? So there's no inherent value. So it's only when you exercise it and that's when you get the benefit. Right, so that's when the tax taxable event takes place. Whereas, if you have an employee that, let's say, in his contract doesn't get options, but he gets stock grant, okay, actual shares, the value of that stock would be income to that employee, just as if he got cash and used it to buy stock. So, I'm not sure if that's your question. Yes. So I, I mentioned that if outside investment came in and the company stated the valuation was X. Uh, then that would now be the, the total value of the company and based on the number of stocks you have, that would be the benefit you'd have to pay on it, right? Well, you wouldn't have to, again, neither of us are tax lawyers here, but you probably wouldn't have to pay anything on it until you realize that gain. So if someone came in and bought your interest at that value, yes. 
that that would be the kind of the deemed value of the company. And so if you if you got your stock for ten bucks and they came in and said, well, it's now worth a hundred dollars, yeah, you've got a capital gain of ninety dollars, right. and then, yes, pay CRA for that. So there's no way of avoiding that. Oh, there probably is, but we're not we're not the best people. We don't call it avoidance; we call it tax planning. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But there no, and that's where there's a, an important team. You need to have the right advisors when you're starting to set these things up. And you know, we're a bit biased, but we think lawyers are part of that team. But also a, a tax it could be a tax lawyer or, or an accountant that can really help you develop some of these programs so that they're you know done in the most tax adva advantageous way that you can. If your if your company grows that, that that much, they may not be able to help you. That's a great thing, but. Uh, you know, clearly you want to see if they can help you a little bit with that. I think, was there another question over here? No? Any other questions? Oh, can you give out this book? Oh, gee, I don't know. No. I can't even think of who's been asking us questions. I guess the gentleman at the back, because he's, he's asked us a few. Sorry, can you pass well, we'll that down the road we'll for We'll stick me? around for a few minutes if anybody wants to uh, exchange business cards or ask a personal question. And uh, anyhow, thank you very much. We really enjoyed it. Thank you.